So, good afternoon, everyone. This is the official good afternoon. <laughs> Tonight, we are back again um, this afternoon, and then leading into the evening, uh, we're back again into session five, as we were just saying. It's um, a continuation of the hardest work um, that, and I'm saying I, um, because it is hard for me, and I'm pretty sure it's hard for all of us who come in contact with this book. I was given um, um, this book years and years ago in Portuguese to read, and every time I went to kind of gather some pieces and bits, you know, from for to help in our other studies here at the SSP, I was like, wait a minute, this is very hard, and there will be a day <laughs> that we will embrace it to really talk about it and really dive into it. And here it is, session five, and tonight we're going to be start talking about chapter seven. Um, the previous sessions we discussed, um, the, the, especially the first, the second, uh, I think the actual, no, now, now that I've got to take this back, uh, session, up to session five, we discussed several chapters. So tonight we'll have some more time to dive into this chapter, which is really important. Um, but you definitely can go back online and look for the previous chapters and learn from it. I would like to say to you that if you do um, decide to embark on this journey as well and learn from it and read it. We have the copies here, um, about three or four still, that you can buy. You can buy that online as well. Um, Editora Leal, um, Publisher Leal, um, is actually um, hold this book. They, they sell online as well. If, if we run out, hopefully we run out <laughs> because it's certainly something that you want to buy. Don't be discouraged that when you open and start studying the book that you feel like, oh my gosh, I can't understand. Because even when I do it, even when I try to present um, this context, the, 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 the text and, and the discussion with you, I have my struggles. I have to go back and I have to rely as well in other works, um, the foundation of spiritism in order for us to um, really, for, at least for me to understand and dive into it. And it's interesting because sometimes I'll read uh, the whole or part of the chapter and you know, a kind of a glimpse of what she's trying to say. And then I read again, it's like, oh, okay, now I understand better. And then as you read more, as you dive into the other um, uh, teachings from Spiritism, it kind of like broadens your perspective on what Joanna the Angel is saying. She says a lot in very few words. And I think it's actually one of the things that we'll master one day when we become enlightened spirits, <laughs> higher order spirits. They can say a whole lot. Um, in few words. So it's an amazing work. So please don't feel discouraged. Study, 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 because it's really important for all of us. As we were saying, oops, as we were saying, we have covered up to chapter six, um, up to um, April of this, this year. Um, and tonight we'll be studying chapter seven, causes of suffering. So we, we already studied up to chapter six on last month. And now we are um, studying causes of suffering, which is part of chapter three. And we have seen some of this idea of what causes suffering to all of us, right? Um, and we have an understanding. And this is the point that I would like to stop and ask you guys. What causes, causes suffering to you? And you don't have to answer because there are several things inside of us. And most of the time, we don't like to say what causes suffering because guess what? Either those around us, they understand that and they use that against us. <laughs> and we have to also acknowledge what? The other side of life, the spiritual side of life. We also um, have our friends from the other side and they know sometimes we try to hide it, right? As we read on the uh, gospel according to, to spiritism, but they know and we don't want to verbalize it. But I want you guys to really think what causes me suffering? What makes my heart sad? What makes us really feel like, and, and, and the, the idea will come, you know, it, this hopefully will you know, we'll develop throughout the talk tonight, but this is something that we should be thinking, not that we wanna think about sadness or madness or anything that causes us suffering, uh, but to really uproot it out of our lives, okay? Before we go into the content tonight, here's another idea that I would like to bring to you, okay? Let us think, and this if you would like to discuss with me, please, or with the public. Let us think of something, an idea, 
or decision that we have made or um, something that later on, something that we did or even a thought that we start creating within ourselves or actions that we develop after a thought, whatever. Um, and we can go on and on and on. Whatever, s something that happened in your life that you had some idea or some control over it, but you did it anyways, that made you suffer afterwards. Does anybody want to take a shot? Okay. Excuse me. Well, you know, suffering's not always bad. So you may be in a situation where you know, like, if you do something, uh, you're going to suffer. But for whatever reason, you decide to do it anyway. In other words, you're willing to pay the price of suffering. So it can be a simple thing. Like, let's say you were going to just graduate from high school. If you went whatever grade you start, eighth grade or whatever, and someone just said, oh, here's your diploma, without any suffering, it would be meaningless to you. So even if a little thing like going through high school, there's all sorts of dramas and think tests you have to pass, so you have to do some suffering. And when you get the diploma, you feel great because you accomplished something you had to suffer. So suffering is not always bad. No one likes to suffer, but for everything in life, you have to pay the price. And if you're not willing to pay the price, you're not going to get anything. Without, <laughs> Daniel is saying, without pain, there is no gain. And this is good because I was inclining more onto something that we do, suffering that came from a wrong action, right, or a torch, something that it actually, we um, uh, um, put a point, we, we really engage into it and we knew that it was wrong. But I think the, it's, it, it's extremely valuable, the example that you brought, because, yes, we have to make sure uh, that we understand the, the amount of energy that it takes to get somewhere. And Joanna D'Angelo has already mentioned this to us as well, that we will f definitely, and we'll see a little bit more about being the physical body tonight, um, incarnated ones, that there is a sacrifice. And this, keep this, this example as, uh, also um, for later on, for later discussions as we develop with the, the topic tonight. But let us take now into something negative, that you knew that you were responding to a personal necessity, a mundane necessity. You knew it was wrong, you did it anyways. Paula. I was with you all along. <laughs> I was thinking of what gets me in trouble. Um, the simplest thing I can think of is I have a medically recommended diet. I mean, if I don't follow it, I'm not gonna fall over tomorrow, but I'm gonna set myself up for trouble. But there's certain foods, of course, I would enjoy. So I had to struggle with that for years. Now it's a little bit easier because it's a normal food. A lot of people enjoy it anyway, but I was advised not to eat it. Paula? Thank you, Paula. <laughs> Daniel's saying French fries. I cannot see Paula, for those of us who follow, cannot see Paula eating French fries at all. And I'm glad that you say this because we all go through this, and I think food is the best way to exemplify what are we going to talk about tonight. We don't want to just stay with the food part of it, but it's very easy. Why? Because we're responding to a, a necessity, an everyday necessity to feed the body. But the thing is, are we truly feeding the body? Or are we going overboard on certain things that we don't need, right? Give an example. We've been trying this at home. It's very hard. Brazilians, without the beans and the rice. <laughs> I was talking to my brother earlier. It's extremely painful. And thank God we have been successful at home that we diminish the amount of carbs that we have. And we eat a whole lot. It's not like, you know, you're eating this with black beans and rice. It's black beans and rice and what else? <laughs> so the quantity as well, it's something really, you know, it's enormous. And we pay the price. We pay the price. Later on, we pay the price. But let's keep this idea in mind. I think that both of them brought ex extremely um, uh, good examples in terms of the price that we have to pay to get somewhere, 
not attending our physical necessities, or sometimes when we lack the understanding or the, the, the idea to get somewhere. And I want to think of, uh, help you develop this idea more into a simple question. What if, what if you were to discarnate, leave this physical body, and come back doing the same thing over and over and over and over? Where would that lead you? Nowhere. Keep that in mind. We're going to finalize with that idea, okay? Joanna the Angel says the following. In the relentless, look at this, relentless pursuit of pleasure, people go from one sensation to the next without realizing that this instability causes the anxiety responsible for the overwhelming suffering that threatens to plunge them into despair until they decide to choose legitimate values over those they deem meaningful but which are mere illusions they will find it very hard to commit to a path that will bring about peace we are repeating on the same ideas relent this pursuit of pleasure we come to the physical body and because we are in the physical body, because we have a, um, and, and I see this in a good way, because we are evolving, because we are in materialistic, of a materialistic nature, more materialistic than spiritual, we tend to attend the body, attend our pleasure. What is shown to us that this is what we're supposed to do. Everybody's doing it. Let's do it too, right? One thing that I would like to focus on this here is values. What is value to you? What is of value to you? I want to, you know, you to think about, you don't have to answer, but I want you to think about it. What is of value to you? What's important to you? Because sometimes we, because we are attending the necessities of the physical body of one, one another, I came across a situation where at work where this, this, um, colleague was was telling me about um, uh, family members that they had uh, they, you know visiting them um, throughout the holidays and all and they prepared the house they did all the things that they like to do and all and then the, I remember the excitement of the person preparing the house for the family members to come over and then after the holidays how everything switched <laughs> what was an excitement became I, a tremendous like uh, madhouse because the person not only stopped living her life to attend others, but she saw that that was not everything. She became a slave of the situation. First of all, very anxious about before it happened. And then during, it was, she saw that it was not everything. And she got upset afterwards. So her uh, expectations towards the whole moment was... And then we were talking about this the other day. Um, in, in a nice way, and it's like, let's lower expectations, right? Because we put value on certain things that is not perfect. And it's okay that it's not perfect. That's why you're here on earth. But it depends how we see, how we connect with these ideas. So what is values? Values through the dictionary.com, uh, the meaning is, the regard that something is held to deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. Of something. Consider someone or something to be important or beneficial. Have a high opinion of. I bring this here because it's important for us to reach out to ourselves, not to others, to ourselves, and ask ourselves, what is of value for me in a relationship, it, you know, at work? At, at, you know, what, what is, the, what is a, a, a dollar worth for me? And don't tell me that it's just a dollar. Because when you have to go back to work, and you, multiple, and you calcu calculate how many hours or the power, part of an hour that it takes for you to make that dollar, you put a different value to it. The, the value is al also very different from one person to the other, right? So what can I do with a dollar? One person will respond A and the other person will respond B. How can I multiply that money? And then the question goes on and on and so on. So value is very different. But what is it value for me? And I mentioned the money, I mentioned all, you know, feelings, relationships, all these things. We have to do these balances. 
This checks and balances every day, and this is something that Joanna DeAngelo is bringing to us. We will talk about what causes suffering, and we will talk about what helps also with um, diminish the suffering. As we mentioned, in chapter uh, 3, page 35 of this book, she says, Excessive desire always causes suffering because it turns into a strong, perturbing emotion which disrupts the delicate gears of balance. Once more, excessive desires. It's okay to want certain things. It's okay to have the drive to accomplish something. But once that kind of like becomes the our 24-7 um, obsessiveness, then we lose ground. And we also bring unbalance to others around us, to the environment where we're living. So let's be careful with this. Yes, we will talk about the idea that it is the mundane pleasure. But there are certain things inside of us that, as we, again, we said through, um, we brought through the gospel according to spiritism, that we don't say it. There are certain necessities that we have that we don't show it to one another because we know that if we do, guess what? People will condemn us. Society, they present a lot of things to us, but when something, when we show our necessities, which we're still evolving, and I'm not um, saying that it's wrong or right or whatever, but a necessity that we have, people say, oh no, this is wrong. Well, this is my necessity, right? Let us think about this. Given continuation, Joanna DeAngelo is very interesting because she acknowledges that we are immortal beings in the physical body. She's not saying to us, and I say this before I even read, she's not saying to us, it's easy. She's done it. But she knows that it's not easy for all of us by saying, living under the demands of a machine that imposes real needs and predisposes them to imaginary and disturbing ones, people opt for the latter. Then these entails the sensations of the domineering ego, pressuring them to pursue the course aspiration at the expenses of the subtle, ennobling ones that thrive in self selflessness, high-minded effort, self-denial, and the cultivation of inner life in the realm of spirit over matter. So she knows it's not a high spirit coming to us and saying, deal with it. You know, find your way. Well, we, we know we have to do that. <laughs> but it's somebody saying, look, pay attention. Yes, you're in the physical body. You grew up in a family, and I'm bringing this as an example. You grew up in a family that forced down your throat black beans and rice. But until when that is necessary for you? Right? You, you grew up in a, in a, in a society where um, everybody had everything. At school, all my friends had everything, but I couldn't have everything. Right? And we know our limitations that we had as well growing up. If we compare our childhood in school to today's kids, it's completely different. You know, what they, oh, I need this. Well, why do you need it? <laughs> I want this. Why do you want it? First answer is, well, everybody has it. And it's okay to kind of compare ourselves to a limit. But let us utilize this to see if there is truly a true value for our evolutionary path on Earth as well as beyond Earth. Why we're like this? Why do we enforce or give more value to mundane things? I'm going to bring an answer to a question that some of us may say, well, has nothing to do with it. It does. We'll get together so we can understand. Question 742 of the Spirit's book. What is the cause that leads humankind to war? And I'm not going to read the whole thing. The predominance of the animal nature over the spiritual and the satisfaction of their passions. That's it. Why do we fight? Why do we argue? Why do we do the mundane things that we do? Because we're still materialistic. The predominance of the animal kingdom that is still inside of us. Once we ascend, and we have seen this through different talks, and we see this through different teachings of, of spiritism, once we ascend from this moment, things will get better. 
but there's got to be, and I think we have done already, we have reached a starting point, but we're still in the early ages of the starting points. So with time, we will then what? Become a little bit less materialistic and more spiritualist to the point that when we see the wrongs that we do, the things that we um, that is enticing us to be materialistic and what causes suffering, and say, no, this is not for me anymore. History books. What is one value of history books? What is it? To, for us to look back and say, no, this not anymore. We wish that was the main value, right? <laughs> but unfortunately, it is not. And one day it will be. There are many things that already we conquered our laws, for example, and certain things that we have seen that we have um, that we have accomplished on Earth that truly exemplifies what I'm trying to say. We look back in history and say, "No, this is not good. We're not going to do this anymore." Right? We start um, uh, creating parameters for our lives that no, we cannot go back to that threshold. Let's raise the bar a little bit more. And this is how we also progress. Look, I did this. Um, um, in last year, now I want to do something even better. Companies, organizations, right? They do the year over year progression. How did they do last year? We do this quarterly with um, organizations as well. The stock market, you're basing yourself from somewhere. What is your base point? And you're comparing as well. How did we grow? And it's the same thing with us. So we have to kind of limit ourselves not to go back not to make this, this poor decisions. As we continue, this is uh, another explanation to her, uh, from Joanna DeAngelis telling us what is the body there for? Why are we in the physical body? Not for rice and black beans. The body should be regarded as a transitory instrument for the eternal being, a temporary sanctuary for the higher purpose of enabling the soul to evolve by means of the enlightening experiences it affords it in the moral, spiritual, and intellectual arenas, as well as by the practice of virtue, by the practice of virtue, excuse me, it should never be an instrument used to cater to the sensations that characterize its molecular constitution. We could just do a talk in this paragraph because it's amazing. There are a lot of things that we can discuss here. And I'll highlight a couple of things here that she's saying. It's a transitory instrument. One of the things that brings us causing suffering, that causes us suffering, um, is the expectation that we put into certain things, the values that we put into certain things. And one of the sufferings that we have is what? Towards the physical body. Because we think that, number one, the physical body is going to be young and well for all our lives. And when we feel pain, what happens? We get upset. We blame others. We blame this. We blame that. We blame the environment. But we never look back and say, what have I done to cause this pain? What can I do to diminish this pain? Because there are certain situations that we can run from it. It may be something that we have to go through, right? Or even, as he mentioned, if I go through this pain right now, what will I attain, obtain in the future? We don't even do that. So we really have to go back and analyze this and look into our evolutionary path in our moral, spiritual, and intellectual arenas. The areas of our life that we are really in the physical body to grow. Sounds redundant, but it's something that we often forget. And Julie, uh, um, Joanna DeAngelis is reminding us that we're studying suffering to get to plenitude, to uproot all of the difficulties that we have, and to make sure that we're not catering to the sensations of the molecular constitution. So it's interesting when she said molecular constitution, because it makes us think, at least to myself, that it's not just... Uh, a want to eat ice cream, to eat sweets. We're talking about molecular constitution. We're talking about it with a, a physical body that has trillions of cells, and they're demanding. As we have our demands, 
these trillion cells, they have their demands as well. But who is the chief of these trillion cells? Our cells. And when I read this, why is Joanna de Angelou uh, saying mo uh, molecular constitution? I mean, she could say the physical body. But she brings down to the molecular constitution. So we really have to pay attention. This is the part of the book when we read and say, okay, she could have said your physical body, but why is she saying this? And it helps us break down into certain situations that we go through in life, certain necessities that I have, but you don't have, Chris. Right? Chris may look at it and say, Leo, that's petty. But that's my necessity, and I have to pay attention to it, and I have to work out. The same way that he would have certain things that I look at and say, eh, that's not for me anymore. Or maybe I will deal with this in the future, because <laughs> now I can't. Each one of us have this molecular constitution that we have to attend, but we cannot become slave, slaves of it. And this is what she's bringing here. Of course, this, is, this does not entail ascetic, isolationist behavior, which fosters the escape from apparent reality. What matters is for the mental life to shape the physical. One can change places without changing one's conduct, living outwardly in one place and inwardly in the other. The lack of attunement between these two ways of living causes individuals to break down due to the appearance of neurosis and a devastating psychosis, imposing suffering that could be avoided if they could only get a better grasp of life's goals. Let's have a balance. Let us balance ourselves. What is important, what's not important. What's the, my break point, right? What can I um, generalize or categorize as the, the moment that I will lose it because we have our limitations, but what's the pushing point also? How can I get better? If I did this today, we move on to the next text, uh, text in the future. And, and, and as she's saying here, what matters is for the mental life to shape the physical. It's not the other way around. If anybody, if I were to knock at your door 5 o'clock tomorrow morning and ask you, feed me breakfast right now, you're going to look at me and say, okay, wait a minute, Leo. You knock on my door now and announced, <laughs> you know, I can help you, but next time let me know, right? But why we let our bodies do that? And again, I want to bring the, the broad sense of this whole thing, not just food, but everything else. Responding to our molecular um, constitution. Why do we let our necessity speak louder than ourselves? Spirits. Just questions for us to think about it. Let us think a little bit more about it because that's why I bring this the thinker uh, by August Roden here, this beautiful sculpture. A rational and lucid examination of one's real needs provides healthy guidance that offers the reward of inner harmony and emotional balance. A rational and lucid, lucid examination. When do we stop to examine ourselves, to examine our situation, how we need to progress, or what is hurting us? The first thing is, is for us to run, right, or to hide in terms of analyzing what is hurting us because we don't want to feel the pain. We don't want to relive the pain. But on the other hand, what we do, we intoxicate ourselves even more with the things that we don't need as a way to escape or to punish ourselves, right? It's very, it's very likely for somebody to eat, 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 and then go into a diet, or a person to do something wrong and then um, later on punish him or herself because they look back and say, oh, this was so petty, this was so, so wrong. Instead of saying, okay, that was wrong, I did it so many times, but now I know one thing, I will not repeat it. And we will see this in the, the end as well. The inordinate pursuit of things entertainment and enjoyment can never fill the pleasure void or on the contrary it frustrates those who fall into its trap pursuit of things entertainment and enjoyment 
what and we're gonna see a little bit more of this um I was actually um, came across um, a movie, and I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a, it's a comedy movie. I love comedy. Um, and I was telling my, our kids to, if they remember, because they watched once with me a long time ago. It's the, it's named, um, the name is uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy. <laughs> you know which one. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> it is a funny movie. For those who watched it, and, and do you remember what happened to the tribe? when they start fighting for that item right huh it's it's a it's a it's an old movie so okay real quick so here's the thing okay so here here's the thing a guy a guy in the is flying an airplane um, um a small airplane he's drinking coca-cola a bottle of co in a bottle an old bottle of coca-cola right he's drinking and guess what the bottle falls off the the um the airplane and if it, this is, he's flying over a a remote area in Africa, and the bottle falls on um, a tribe near a tribe, one of the tribe members finds the bottle, and guess what? They think that God sent the bottle to you know to them, and they they start making sounds with the bottle. They start cooking and hitting things with the bottle. They saw that it made sound, and that became the item you know throughout the 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 um, the uh, the tribe. The problem was that. It started creating problems between them, right? Who want? Who would have? Who would hold the bottle? Who would play for the? You know, with the bottle for so many, you know, hours because they didn't even have hours, but for the time of the day. So the chief decided to do what? Decided to walk to the end of the land to throw the bottle away because he noticed that that amazing, right? Item, which if we think about it, that you know, how we carry things is an amazing discovery. You know, the bottles, how we develop um, glass, how we develop plastic that is now polluting so much. But how we develop, but that our own development brings us what? Despair, suffering. So he wanted to uproot the, the problem, and that's what he did. He walked, and the movie goes on and on and on. But this is for us just to um, analyze and exemplify how our, our pursuit in entertainment of entertainment and mundane things causes us suffering. And it's okay to a certain degree that, yes, you have to take a vacation. You have to you know, find some entertainment. Some people love to go to the movies. Some people love to go out and you know, go to dinner. Some people like to buy things. But to what limit? And we go back to ourselves, our true constitution. We are spirits. Temporarily, in this beautiful machine that God gave, uh, gave us. I'm going to take four um, steps, uh, four uh, highlights that from the Spirit's book that is very, that very important for this part of the book that the Spirit brings to us by saying that, number one, the right of the use of the fruits of the earth is a consequence of the need to stay alive. God would not impose a duty without granting the means to fulfill it. It's not the other way around. I'll say it again. The right of the use of the fruits of the earth is a consequence of the needs to stay alive. God gave us all that we see to stay alive. So the idea is what? Stay alive. Find your way. Discover things. Multiply things. But do not let those things consume you. And it's amazing how we come even closer to God when we read this because it's like, wow, I never thought about this. God is giving us the, mean, the, the means to survive, to stay um, alive in every sense of the word, not only in the physical body, but alive in the development of the, the self, but not to abuse it. God has made the enjoyment of material things attract, attractive to drive us to the fulfillment of our mission and also to test us with temptation. It's not that God is saying, okay, I'm going to help a group of people develop a beautiful car so Leo falls into temptation. No, that's not the drive. <laughs> that is not the drive. The drive is, okay, with the develop machines, perhaps one day, you know, the humans will be able to fly to places a little bit faster, more safer. Right? I used to condemn, even though I like it, um, races, car races. But a lot of technology that we have in our cars nowadays, 
comes from races. How much a car may slide on the road, and there are certain terms that we're not going to use, slide on the road or not, suspension comes from races. So let us bless those who <laughs> engage in some craziness. Not that we have to engage into it as well, but that's where it comes from. The purpose of temptation is to develop our reason so that we may keep ourselves from excesses. The purpose of temptation is to develop our reason. How does this happen? If we eat too much, and this is actually in the Spirit's book, we, are, we, we have what? Indigestion, right? It's directly from the Spirit's book. I don't remember the answer, the answer right now. But when we feel that indigestion, it's a sign that, look, don't do this again. Don't do this again. We have the checks and balances within ourselves. Our physical body, again, telling us, oh, wait a minute. No. When we get to a certain age or certain situations of our lives that we have, uh, uh, we start being accompanied by the friend called diabetes. What is it? It's the body saying, look, you took care of my, my, my work. Now, now, you know, I don't have to do that anymore. I'll leave it up to you to take care of it since you ate so much sweet, sweets. <laughs> now, I don't have to do that anymore. Sometimes it's something that we bring within ourselves. Sometimes we develop. And I'm not criticizing. I'm just kind of reminding one another about it. Nature traces the limits of enjoyments to show us what is necessary. And through our ex excesses, we bring on sati satiate. And thus, we punish ourselves. It's the, it's the feeling of being full. I know you looked at it and said it's satiate. Yes. Yes. It's the, it's the position of being full. Um, in, or satisfied, we can put that way. Um, and then we punish our, ourselves. You know, if we go overboard, we tend to do that. We tend to punish ourselves. Why get to that point? Why get to the point that we have to punish ourselves for something that we have done? Let's start doing the right things little by little and then invite ourselves to continue in the same path. But as we go on, I want to dive into the part that Joanna de Angelis says the following. There are individuals who co have considerable wealth, social prestige, fame, and intelligence, thanks to which they can acquire whatever they please, travel, whatever they want, wherever they want, and relate with all sorts of different people. And yet, they are tormented by emptiness, boredom, and dissatisfaction. A powerful, but these are powerful causes of suffering. Not Leo saying, Joanna de Angelis saying. Right? And where do we see this? Social media nowadays. It's great. Because you look at social media and you see all these beautiful places. I won. I post a bunch of them. But the, the problem is when we look at these things and the same problems that the tribe <laughs> start to have, you know, with the Coca-Cola bottle, we start to have it as well. Why? Instead of bringing joy to see, oh, this is a beautiful place. I wish I could be in this place one day if I have the opportunity. Let's grow, you know. But when that, when I look at it and that brings discomfort because others are doing but I cannot do it, then that's a problem. Or if I came in contact with a person, a situation, have a, um, um, a, a capability to do something that others don't, uh, don't have it. And then when I don't have any more, I become an unhappy individual. Then that's a problem. It's a very hard road to look at, every, uh, at everything but not wish it or not think that we deserve or it's ours. Right? So we really have to think about it. We really have to analyze that there are individuals that can do it, and they do it well. And this goes back to the idea of wealth in our society, right? If we were to divide the wealth of the planet, you know, equally amongst ourselves, each of us will probably take that money and do something that is not of value, and we would not be able to multiply it. So it's good that a lot of people, they have it a lot, and they know how to multiply it. It's interesting that some people, they have the money, but the value that they have or the understanding 
of the value of that money, of that quantity, if we don't want to just say um, in terms of money, it's completely different than ours. The detachment that they have. We have to think about that. So she's saying the search for reality, the self, must begin with a deep inwardly analysis of life's real needs and never with the preference for adornments, objects of situations. The only emphasis, the, the emph the only emphasis of the ego, excuse me, and excuse me, the these only emphasize the ego and perturb it, making it proud and boastful, or in their absence, bitter, resentful, and fearful. We can wish, we can look at it, we can come in contact, but we have to detach ourselves. It should not be um, something that troubles us. And we see a lot of this happening with um, our, our younger generations now because they're, they're being bombarded. My friend have this, my friend, and it's very fast, way faster than I had it. Well, I don't like to say, thank God we didn't have social media then, right? Uh, because I think it's, social media is it's powerful, it's helpful, um, it keeps us connected. But the level that we let ourselves get into it, and I'm not, again, the minister saying something negative, but really analyzing how can, can this help us and how it can also make us unhappy. And that's what, exactly what Joanna Giangeli is saying. If we think about, of, of, you know, since we're talking about Joanna Giangeli, the, the, through the hands of um, Devaldo Franco, we, many of you receives the emails on social media as well of what Devaldo is doing throughout the world. What a blessing to know what the man with his age is doing because we have social media. Daniel One, he, he distributes a lot of material on what's happening as well in that sense. And what if we didn't have social media? So it's a powerful thing. I can discuss with anybody that is a powerful thing, but now... How we utilize it is our, our problem, right? How we let this destroy ourselves is our problem, right? And these are just um, helpful tips that she will bring to us as well uh, before we dive into three examples that we'd like to share. Uh, when she says, first, one must acquire a state of spiritual peace to experience everything without becoming attached to anything. Talking about the Valdo Franco, I remember a passage on one of his talk that he was um, he was in uh, Mexico City, if I'm not mistaken, and he was actually at the the hotel where he was staying uh, for the work that he was doing in Mexico City, um, and he was he was talking, analyzing his situation, and and. With Joanna the Angel, and Joanna the Angel approaches him and say, "Everything," as he was looking outside, "Everything is yours." And he's like, "Everything is mine." <laughs> yes, everything is yours. <laughs> and he's like, "How can it be mine? I never paid for. It. I don't have any." But everything is. If you think about it, everything is ours. If we look outside now, if we look all of this here, it's all yours, isn't it? We're here. We're sitting down. Do we pay a price? Yeah, we pay a price for the the location, but the chair is ours. This is ours. If we go home, everything is the community that we are. It's ours, but it's ours how? And this is the point that Joanna D'Angelo makes. It's ours how? God gave all of this for us or, ourselves. Do we have to own it in the sense that we paid for? And there is a document that says that it's Leo's or somebody else's. No, but it's all for us to live, to educate ourselves, to feel at peace as well. Because sometimes we go to places and, oh, I wish I had this. We go to somebody's place and say, like, oh, this is nice. No, well, if, I, if anybody comes to our house, we want to make everybody feel at home. Yes, there is a deed <laughs> that you pay for the house or you're renting and all, a rent agreement. But guess what? It's your home as well. And once we start changing, you know, the ownership idea of things, we live better we live lighter, we become a little bit freer than um, demanding things or expecting things that perhaps in this life I would never have. 
I would never have. And I don't need it. I wrote a front, um, a Dutra one time. He was actually talking, um, I believe, in PA when we went there. Um, and he said something funny. The, the, the president of the United States not only needed one airplane, Air Force One, but it needs another one, right, as a decoy. And guess what? The I forget the name now. The helicopters, the Marine one. It's not only one, it's like not only two, but it's three. <laughs> if you see one, most likely you will see the other two because the other two are decoys. I did not know this, but it is true, actually. They use the other two um, helicopters as decoys because you never know which helicopters the, the, the president will be in. Do I need one? I think it's fantastic. It's awesome, right? You know, the, the structure of what the airplane can do and all that. But I don't need one. We don't need an airplane. We have several that we can just pay a ticket and get into whatever we want. <laughs> it's all ours, right? So let us think about the detachment that we have to create towards things. It's at our disposal, and we should treat it nicely, and we should utilize uh, uh, safely, if we can say that way. But let's bring the ownership into a different perspective. Liberation will occur only when people empty themselves of ambition, embracing inner selflessness, and overcoming desires. The liberation of the mind, the liberation of the heart, right? When we empty ourselves, do I really need it? Do I need, really need the, 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 the closet full of things or the, um, the, the different, different junk that we carry with ourselves? I'll give you an example. My wife yesterday was actually um, talking about my... Uh, number of messages that I have on my phone. I don't delete them. The people who leave me message, I just it just stays there. <laughs> I really have to go back and. But interesting enough, it, and Daniel have seen it too. Yeah. So everybody's now, Leo, you doing? But interesting enough, I came in contact with one of my customers, and she recently um, um, lost her husband. And. You can see the struggle to let go of the things that he couldn't let go. Look at this. He passed. Now she's suffering because, obviously, a loss of loved one. But she's also debating on the things that she has to let go. And she said to me, I know, Leo, I have to let go. And I told her, look, time will come that you will be able to do so. Don't struggle with yourself. Don't beat yourself up because we shouldn't do that. But time will come that you have to do that. Because she, know, she knew that he didn't want to let go of these things. And one item, interesting enough, was a small calculator, really interesting small calculator that he kept. And I'm utilizing this because it makes us think. We have a trillions of calculators in the universe. <laughs> calculators in the computer, calculators in our phones. But that calculator was the calculator right? And we pass. We don't take anything with us, but we leave the feeling in, onto others that, no, no, don't throw that away. That was my best shirt. <laughs> don't throw that away. Well, who's going to wear it? So then we change the value that we put into things, right? Self-knowledge helps, uh, helps one understand what is useful or superfluous. Essential or secondary for a happy life? Self-knowledge. Who wants to get to know ourselves? It's hard. It's hard to get to the core of ourselves and say, do I really need this? Or why do I want this? What drives me to want this? And now we can expand this to relationships, to ideas, to uh, the things that we do day in and day out, the way we do things as well, because perhaps if we were to change a little bit, we would be more effective in certain things that we do and happier. But we insist to do the same things the same way over and over and over. It's tough. It's very interesting that at work sometimes when, you know, people, st oh, so you, you, you show something for an individual uh, to do, and you go back and obviously, did the person accomplish this or not? Those who lead someone, a group of people, have worked with other individuals, and this some, this sometimes help is, help happens uh, the other way around. 
that you go and check the work and you see the person did three times faster than you did, then you can do it. And you're like, okay, how did you do this? <laughs> and I usually like to joke because I look at it and say, and the person explains, I'm like, wow, that was really neat. And I thought I knew everything, right? Because we, you know, it's like, well, I thought that I had, you know, completely control of it. And we, right, surprise ourselves. Because I never took the time to think, can I do this a little bit faster, right? Or the other way around, when somebody tells you to do something, you do something, it's like, well, that was easy. But you, you look at the other person doing that, you see that the person struggles. It's not a bad thing. What I'm just trying to say is, rethink about the way you do things. We think about your necessities. Perhaps there is all the way, another way out. Because we know one thing for sure, the results, the suffering that this is causing, it's not easy. When you have to go back and redo something, when you have to go back and relieve that idea over and over again, before you can even have the strength to change, it takes a while sometimes, right? I would like to change a little bit here for us to exemplify um, um, two, actually one of these examples that we're gonna bring here. Joanna Viangeli brings in the, towards the end of the chapter, and it's the following. Passages from the Bible. The cost of following Jesus. This is what she brings. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. It's actually kind of a beautiful verse, right? That we can remember. And she brings this, uh, this, this part of, um, of the Bible that is in Luke uh, chapter 9, um, verse 57. I put the whole thing in there. Uh, 57 from 62 is where actually we see this discussion of Jesus, or following Jesus, of the cost of following Jesus. And when we say Jesus here, it's not following the physical individual that we tend to see Jesus, but what he brought to us, our way to our creator, right? There is a huge cost for it. This week we were talking at home at our God at home about the cost of things that Emmanuel brings to us in the book, in the, book um, the Living Spring. The cost of things. There's a cost for these ele um, electricity. To provide the electricity, there was a cost as well to generators, right? Producing the energy. And the way for us to help, whenever we help somebody, there is a cost. And we have to understand that there is a cost when we receive it as well when we give out because it makes us more effective. It makes us go back and say, am I going to turn the light just to leave it on or is the purpose to bring light for everybody so they can, we can see one another and it becomes a respectable place, right? And then we see the value. Even if we were to pay $500 for the time that we are here today, it would be our value that $500 has a different meaning for us because this is more important. Thank God it's not $500. <laughs> but I'm just giving you an example. So there is a cost to help. And for Jesus, he put everything aside. He, we know that God gives every, everything, the animals, the plants, the environment, ourselves, as we already learned through the, um, the spirits as well earlier, that gives us the meaning to carry ourselves through the physical life. It's up to us, but we shouldn't be attached to it. The second one, the rich and the kingdom of God. This is when a man comes to Jesus and say, well, I have mastered several of the commandments, but what do I really have to do to become a, to reach morality, to become a moral individual? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow, follow me. Did he do it? No. And then Jesus go into the discussion that it's easier for what? An elephant to go through a needle than huh? a camel. Thank you. <laughs> I'm making it bigger, guys. <laughs> I'm giving more value to it. Thank you, a camel. Uh, through, through a needle, then somebody to change, right? And it is true. It's us letting go. Okay, I need to follow this path, but 
you know, let me do it again. And it's hard, we know. And this is why we're giving this reminder so that later on when we uh, talk about the different chapters that she's going to bring to us, at least we have this reminder. Before it can get anywhere, I have to take care of these sufferings. I have to take care of these needs that I think that are so important to myself and sometimes to others, right, or the expectations and move on. So these two, and the last one that I would like to bring before we finalize is this one here. The parable of the prodigal son. What did the young son tell the father? We know the parable. We have studied. We have come across. It's interesting because I'm also the youngest son, but I didn't have anything to ask my parents. <laughs> Can you give my share? We didn't have any share. You know, we had what we had. <laughs> Thank God, you know. But um, it's interesting because we have the, the younger son and we have the older son. And we can learn a whole lot. And we're not going to go through the whole detailing. I mean, that's be another talk that we can talk about it. But what did the uh, prodigal son did? He asked for his share. Whatever is mine, let me have it. I want to live it. I want to use it. I want to go out there and, and, and be the man. Attending what? His necessities. The necessities, obviously, that he thought it was important. It was of value. But... We, right after, he sees what? Those demands didn't serve any purpose. And he falls into despair because he couldn't even eat what the animals that he was actually serving or helping as a worker could eat. And he started thinking, wait a minute. My father's workers have way more, have better food than I have right now. They have what they need, and they're happy. Here is an, ex an, an, an explanation of a parable showing as if we were with, in fact, our physical fathers, right? But we're talking about the Father, the Creator. Sometimes we allow ourselves into, you know, fall into temptations, looking for things that are mundane, that we think it's the best, the best vacations, the best um, 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 material life, and then later on and say, well, do I really need this? The body start getting older and older, or we fall um, under the necessities to go through and rescue some of the things inside of us through pain. And then we go back and say, wait a minute, is this really of necessity? Right? So that is a way that we can also apply this parable in our lives. And do not let ourselves to think that the animals are living better lives than ours. Sometimes I do this with my dog. <laughs> he doesn't have to eat. I'm sorry. He doesn't have to study. He doesn't have to go to work or anything. But that's his life right now. And I usually, you know, play with him and joke with him. Look, pay attention. You know, I'm actually working. I'm going to work right now. Because one day you will have to do this as well. As the, you know, the, the mind develops... I don't know if you remember, but <laughs> but I usually like to joke, you know. And my kids look at me like, "What is he saying? <laughs> what is he saying?" And I tell my 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 I, I also talk to my kids. I was actually talking to Juliana, my oldest one, and she was saying that you know the the being a junior now, next year being a um, a senior, um, that high school is pretty difficult and pretty hard. I'm like, yeah, okay. Remember when we used to t talk about preschool being hard and I used to tell you that wait until you get to high school <laughs> and I you know and, and, and it, interesting enough that she was driving so you see the development I was like okay so think about when you're in college when you are defending a thesis right for your doctor's degree it's going to be harder and you're going to look back and say oh man I wish I was back you know back there right but embrace it live it because many of us don't have the capability to do so. So we have to look at it, um, as he was saying, before you get to that degree, before you get to that point, there will be pain. But do not become attached to it, even to the titles when we attain them, through hard work. To finalize this in more and more um, presentation, 
It is very difficult to break free from atavism, those belongings that and habits that pervade one's behavior, to begin constructing a new prevailing nature. Under the burden of such dependencies, individuals fell to see, fall to see the light, to discern the goal, to free themselves in order to find themselves. The only time that the prodigal son saw this was through pain, after the fact. And what the, Joanna the Angelus says, let us sit down and analyze. Okay, if I ask my father for my, the good things that I have in life right now so I can live what I consider life, what will be the consequences? If I let myself into the situations or conditions of life, what will be the consequences? Will I have to go back to the father and ask to become not the son, but to become a servant? Right? Creating discord in the family because those around me who expected something better of me as well, they will be upset, just like the older brother. Wait a minute, I've been here the whole time. And... Leo comes back after party now and you consider him back. But the father says something really interesting. You've always been with me and everything that I have, it's yours. To the older son who was upset as well. And this is in the um, parable as well. They confuse peace with the tranquility backed by their possessions, which give them comfort and social prominence, but also arouse envy. Moreover, possessions may be lost at any moment due to, no, to the normal vicissitudes that catch everyone off guard. Death, for instance, which forces them to leave everything behind, but does not always bring release. For torments continue beyond the physical dimension. And if we can kind of close this in the stone, it's very important. Because... Imagine ourselves getting to the other side, and we see this in Ocelar, and we see this in other, other books as well, and getting up in the morning and saying, where's my Apple Watch? Where's my phone? <laughs> where's the car key? It happens more often than we can think. When we're looking for the garments as well, right? Where is it? Where's the loved one? My wife, my husband, my kids, we have to learn how to live in balance. And this is not easy, folks. I'm, I'm learning as well. That's why I'm here talking. <laughs> Perhaps I need more of this than anybody else. But we have to um, help one another get there. Imagine if we get to the other side, as we are starting getting to the other side, right? As some of us have done across the, you know, the physical boundaries, and when we get to the other side, the individual say, welcome. And you're prepared to that welcome. Those who stay here, they're going to long, they will feel sad, but they will look at it and say, farewell. You did well. I hope I can do the same thing. It's very hard to think about it, right? But we have to do it with enthusiasm and happiness. To get to the other side and receive that welcome and say, okay, I'm back here. And I don't need <laughs> my phone to call anybody. <laughs> I don't need to get the car key to go anywhere. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Her last words in this chapter. Suffering must be overcome by love, meditation, and the understanding of its presence in the lives of all beings as a cause of progress, a need for re re-education, and a mechanism of evolution that lingers in the discern discerning individuals who think for themselves, since the goal of reincarnation is to triumph over it. Let us work together. Let us think with one another. Think for ourselves, as she's saying. Because one thing is for Joanna the Angelus coming to us, come to us and say A, B, and C, how we should live our lives. But how do we apply it? Our parents, they dictate a lot of things to ourselves, to all of us. Right? They said great things. But they also said things that perhaps we look at it nowadays and say, well, wait a minute. Let me change this a little bit because it doesn't belong to my setting nowadays. Same thing for my kids when I tell them certain things. 
I tell them, look, develop what I'm telling you. You don't have to follow the same exactly way, but look and learn from it. And hopefully we do the same thing with our parents. But we have to think for ourselves. We have to find the value for ourselves. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. And we're going to start following things that later on, because we heard that it's right or wrong, we crash. So think for ourselves. This way, I would like to finalize with this. Remember when I asked you at the beginning of the talk to think of something that we have chosen that brought some difficulties to our lives. I got this when I came in contact. I got the idea for um, when I came in contact with this idea of the eternal return of the same by the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche. When he proposed a better life in the sense that if we were to make a decision right now in our lives, that this decision would be relived over and over and over. We die doing the same thing and we wake up again doing the same. He was not a reincarnationist or, or, or an idea that had the idea that we would come back. But it makes us think, and we don't have to take a face value in terms of this is what's going to happen, so please don't be afraid. But this makes us think on the decisions that we make in life, right? The same thing if we apply this for positive things. If we keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over, how we will develop. So the idea here is for us to look at and say, yeah, perhaps today I'm learning this in this physical body. The decisions that I'm making it will be helpful if I continue to make them, if I were to continue them, but I have to develop even more. I have to change. You see how I'm actually multiplying now because Nietzsche is just saying, you do something, this is what you're going to have to do for the rest of your life, for the rest of eternity. That's why it says return of the same. You're going back to the same thing over and over and over. It's scary. <laughs> it is scary. In both ways of life, doing the right things and doing the, wrong, um, doing the wrong things and doing the right things as well, we have to develop. So our choices should be according to the common good. That if we were to do it, I would make Dioni happy, Isabella, Kirsten, everybody happy. But at the same time, for my own development as well. To become a higher being, as Joanna de Angelis, we also have to develop in different areas, in different conditions. This is the proposal for tonight, for us to uproot suffering from our lives, and then we can find, as we continue through these different chapters that we still have until the end of the year, we have, what, seven more months, seven more chapters, for us to get to plenitude. And it doesn't mean that January 1st comes along, <laughs> because the last session will be in December, that we'll find a plenitude. Now, perhaps January 1st of um, 7,000 and something year, right? We don't know, we don't know. Perhaps, hopefully, before. But we go back to the examples that we bought at the beginning, right? That we discussed at the beginning. Pain is necessary to attain certain things, to develop. The pain that we're talking about today that we can uh, alleviate ourselves the causes of suffering that we have to alleviate ourselves from is those that when it's implied on us or it's imposed on us through ourselves, right, to attend an immediate need that we have. For no better of consequences, better consequences for someone else. Because sometimes, yes, we take upon ourselves that, okay, you're going to do this, right? It's going to make me suffer. It's going to be tough but it will bring some goodness to others. The utilitarian idea that Joanna D'Angelo brings to us, to a certain extent, is good. You make a decision to make others happy, but until when, you also have to take that in consideration. So we hope that these ideas that Joanna D'Angelo has brought um, to all of us um, will bring us some comfort. I would like to say before brings comfort, most likely will bring some discomfort because when we think about ourselves, when we, not point fingers, but when we decide to criticize to bring the better of ourselves, um, guess what? It's, it's hard. 
Love, I heard of this, I heard this last year. Love is the action of bringing the good out of us. I can't remember the name of the, the, the priest who said it, but I went to a mass uh, last year. When I heard it, I was like, yeah, it is true. And it gives basis to the tough love that some mothers, they like to impose on us, right? When they say, no, you have to do it. What is wrong with you? <laughs> like Yasko like to say, right? What is wrong with you, right? It's the tough love. Get up and go. We're looking at half Raphael now and got up. Come on. It's probably very hard for him to get up. But we keep saying it. Imagine our mentors looking at us and saying, Leo, get up. <laughs> keep going. And sometimes we're kind of slouchy and, you know, we don't want to do it. It brings us suffering. So with no further ado, um, in this sense, um, analyze ourselves and bring yourself some happiness by uprooting these ideas from your heart. And I would like to hear from you a couple of questions, a couple of comments if you have. This is the moment for our new friends and welcome, by the way, I should have said at the beginning, um, um, that we give ourselves a couple moments to say something um, that is in accordance with the topic or questions that you may have. And hopefully we can answer. We cannot answer everything, but I'll bring it to Yasko back here. Can you go back to your, there was one slide there about the dichotomy between the spiritual being versus material causing neurosis. Can you put that? Yeah, I like that. Uh, uh, just to read it again. Um, uh, uh, the past, yeah. Yeah, so of course this does not enta entail ascetic isolationist, ascetic Okay, isolation is behavior which fosters the escape from apparent reality. What matter is for the mental life to shape the physical. One can change place without changing one's conduct, living outwardly, etc., etc. This was the cause of neurosis somewhere? Yeah. So what I was thinking that we are still in a stage that we play different persona. Uh, I think is we always playing like we are one person here in the spirit center, very well, you know, behaving. Even our voices are very nice, and we may be completely different person in the traffic. We may be a different person if we are put in a long line in the supermarket and someone pass. Or, you know, those challenges. But, you know, the, what she's saying there, that this will cause, this dichotomy, will cause devastating psychosis. Look how tough she is. Bringing do, uh, uh, some neurosis, imposing suffering that could be avoided if they could be only get a better grasp of life's goals. So I think we cannot expect too much to be different here, be almost a saint, and allow ourselves to be, you know, a opposite persona, because in, the, in this way, I don't know who I am. I think we get in these things of neurosis, and so not too much of one side, not too much the other side. We try to be in the middle somehow in terms of behaving personality. It is true, Yasko, and I, I agree with you. The only thing that, that we, at least for myself, that I would like to uh, bring emphasis to is that um, it's not that we know ourselves and we use um, of different um, personas. I think it is the other way around. We don't know ourselves. That's why we use different personas. That's why we're different individuals. And we don't meet ourselves in the middle. Um, 
there is a, a level of conformity of with laws, with norms of um, uh, in society. Um, and we see this when we travel from one place in the world to another, that perhaps certain things, and since, you know, uh, my background, you know, being Brazilian, that we do in Brazil, that it's like completely, wait a minute, you don't do that in the U.S. Um, and I'm trying to, and I'm talking about um, uh, human things, right? Different things that we do, the hugging, the, the way we, we kind of stand next, next to the other, um, you know, without elevating to the things that we truly know that causes neurosis, as we say, that for us, you know, Americans, when we actually stand in line in Brazil, it creates a neurosis because the person is right next to you here, right? Yeah, so it does create a neurosis. I should say that because I have become Americanized enough that when I'm standing in line in Brazil, I look at it and say, wait a minute, are you trying to hug me? <laughs> because you're too close. And I lost that already. And I tell this to my American friends, and it's hard to understand because they never went through it. But I, I think that we don't know ourselves enough. That's why we use of these different personas. Um, in this example, um, we also have to understand that it's okay for us to also be different personas to attend a need to a certain level, not to lose ourselves, not to lose our individuality, right, or who we are. But, for example, when you do travel to certain cultures, guess what? You will have to embrace the culture. You can't just expect everybody to change. We have a friend who was traveling to Japan uh, recently, uh, right after, a common friend, and right after uh, I actually did a work in the Japanese culture that I found extremely, <laughs> extremely different than ours. And, uh, you know, I mentioned a couple of things to her, and she's like, Leo, it is exactly as you put it. So, and it's interesting. But you go to that place, guess what? You play the rules, but you're not going to lose yourself, right? It's the cultural intelligence that we have to develop. Now, how do we get to know ourselves? This is the point, that I'm not using ex uh, um, um, different masks to attend mundane needs. And you are correct. We have to find this balance. We have to find this way to say, this is okay, this is not okay. Or, this was okay for me yesterday, but not anymore. Daniel. Thank you, Leo. It was a very nice presentation, this chapter from uh, the book Plenitude. I just wanted to um, make a comment because last Saturday we talked about uh, health and disease and we, br we brought some of uh, the physical laws. One of the laws that, um, besides the, the common one that we know, action and reaction, but uh, there is one that is the pendulous law that always tend to come to the middle, the balance. So I think um, just to summarize what Joanna is bringing in this chapter is that there is not, not like physical law, spiritual law, it's just one law, it's God's law. And this law is applicable to everything, matter and even our spiritual and our body. So, um, and the other thing is that she brought in this part that he asked, just raise, um, made her comment is regard to our uh, mind and the neurosis. Um, and one thing that we learn as we grow spiritually in spiritism is that what's the difference between our level and our benefactor, those that are more evolved spiritually, is one thing. They control their mind very well at a point that they can focus their mind in goodness more time than us because we have this fragmental, as the ask mentioned last, you know, moment of goodness, love. We are not like continuous, like we have our thought that is continuous, although we are conscious, conscient of this thought or not. So I think one of the reflections that um, we should um, bring from this chapter, and by the way, it was a very nice presentation and everything that we brought from Jesus' teachings and also from the Spirit's book, is that um, the big challenge that we have is learn how to focus. And, and be focus is not like, okay, be just one 
side is is be balanced, pay attention to the Pandas law, and be cultural intelligence, as you mentioned, since we live in a different um, places, even inside of this country here, if you move to the West Coast, things are going to be different, little different from the, the East Coast. So there is, we need to learn how to adapt it. To learn to how to adapt, we need to focus on what moment we are living. So I just want to bring this comment in this chapter and, and, and real, he will hear a nice presentation. Soon enough, um, I'm going to say this in the as I walk away from her, Kirsten and I will um, talk a little bit more about cultural intelligence. She actually have done a great um, presentation on it, um, but we're going to talk more in the future because I think it's something that we lack, right? Not to impose, but to spark new things on others. And I, I think that if there is anything that I'm very grateful of is in the sense of um, migrating to another country is what I have learned from this culture um, and how I bring the best of me that I brought from Brazil, not the black beans and rice, <laughs> and onto others as well, because we can learn from one another. But the other point that I would like to um, mention um, and give emphasis to what Daniel was saying, it is true. Um, one of the things, and correct if I'm saying this, um, the, the, the word correct, homeostasis, right? Homeostasis, thank you. I always pronounce it wrongly. Um, what is it? It's the sense, the, 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 the balance that we find on everything, every living being, the ecology in general, biology, brings, looks for this balance. You go to one side, goes to the other side. You drink something extremely acidic, what does your body do? Right? Scream, but at, most, at the same time, it looks for balance by looking for alkaline, elements in our physical bodies. It's amazing. It's amazing. So don't drink acidic thinking that just things will take care of it itself. It will, however, it will cause pain. <laughs> it's the same thing. So we find this balance in our physical body. Just like Daniel said, look in the middle. Yes, can I deviate a little bit and attend the things that we need to attend? It's okay. But how much do you want to go to one side? Because guess what? You're going to have to compensate. And compensating to the other side is going to take energy. It's going to take time. So look for it. To finalize, Paula, please. I'm going to take, and thank you, that was excellent and good food for thought. I'm going to take a sentence here that was up on one of your slides and just comment on something I saw on TV last night that I think ties in with the question here. It's very difficult to break free from atavisms, those belongings and habits that pervade one's behavior to begin constructing a new prevailing nature. And I think that's a major theme that we keep returning to is self-knowledge and how do I become more aware of myself. Well, one thing in this culture that is still evolving is um, therapy and taking advantage of different mental health therapies be that in a 12-step group, a group therapy, or individual. And I'm not saying everyone will go there. A lot of people read books and have good discussions. You have to be open to feedback, though. But last night I watched a TV program that I would suggest other people might want to watch because the change in this person was remarkable. And it was an older man. Because we have that statement, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you can because it depends on the individual and their level of motivation and saying, I'm going to work hard at this. So this person chose to go into psychoanalysis four days a week with a therapist in New York City. He had the means to do it. But he evolved from being a radio show host who was quite shocking into a conversation last night on CNN with Anderson Cooper that blew me out of the water. I have not seen two men have such an honest conversation about their feelings, their childhood upbringing, looking back on behaviors when they were younger and now figuring out why they did it. Thank you. That's a point that we want to get in life, so thank you. I actually have to get more details on that because I want to watch the conversation now too. <laughs> awesome. 
So it's a it's a preparation for it perhaps was a preparation for this. So thank you. It it helps the environment. It helps um when we were thinking as we bring these examples of the courageous women, men that goes out there and say, look, it can be done. There are two things that I always like to tell people, especially my kids. If I can do it, you can do it. And if you can do it, I can do it also. And I'm not saying better or worse, but we can do it. It may not be now. I may not be able to go to a, 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 a series of, of self-knowledge um, um, sessions or uh, work four days a week. At least we can do it 10 minutes, maybe two minutes. Give yourself at least a chance or, or call on yourself. I need to get to know myself in the morning, in the afternoon, when you have a quiet time. Seclude yourself from everything, not in a way that you're going to be egotistic or, or to save yourself from the world, but have your own time. It's important for us. Jesus did it. So it's not that he was being, because when he had to help others, he helped others. He, he taught us so much, but he had the moment that he had to meditate. Joanna the Angelus in the spirit, um, Spiritist arena, she is really um, uh, adamant about the idea of meditation, of finding a moment for yourself to do this evaluation that Paul is saying. So we thank you so much. We would like to invite everyone then for us to pray together, finalize this evening with this idea um, that these ideas that Joanna the Angelus brings to us, I forgot to mention, but in the next session, um, we will be talking about pathways to help uh, to health. Joanna De Angelis um, uh, goes into um, the pathways to health um, in 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 the, the process of self healing. Um, but she still kind of reminds herself in these chapters, chapters and the following chapters well about suffering. So she faces, she looks at it instead of hiding or telling us to hide it. So that's something that's also we have to remind ourselves. Even though we may be in a position where, okay, now I understand this, but look back. And towards the end of this conversation, this conversation, I will remind yourself that this is what we have to do to transfer from a planet of trials and expiation to of regeneration. Okay? Because to be in a planet of regeneration is not that we are well. We have to be really aware of our shortcomings, of our necessities that are not true necessities, so we don't fall back. And this is something that we also have to take with ourselves. We thank you, and uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next part of our visualization and passes.